welcome to the Book of Mormon Evidence Podcast with host Rod Meldrum. This week's Come Follow Me supplemental study is Lesson 44, Ether 1 through 5. Rend that veil of unbelief. We welcome our guest, Stephen Smoot, who is the president of the Family First Foundation and president of Excel Investment Corporation and Watchman Properties. He's an author of the book Lost American Antiquities, A Hidden History, and co producer of many documentaries. Welcome everybody to our our next episode of the uh, of our Come Follow Me supplemental podcast. Again, we want to reiterate that uh, we, we're, the anticipation is is that you've already read the lesson manual and the information that goes along with this. And this is for additional in depth information. And I have with me a dear friend of mine. This is uh, my friend Stephen Smoot, and uh, and uh, many of you, if you've been to our conferences and so forth, you probably know already about Steve and some of his uh, amazing research, but. Uh, to just tell you a little bit more about Steve to kind of begin with here. Steve is actually, he's the president of the Family First Foundation. He also owns a couple of companies, Excel uh, Investment Corporation and Watchman Properties. Uh, Steve's a historian, he's a documentarian, and uh, he's also an author of, of several books. And uh, one of my personal favorite ones is this particular <laughs> book right here, which we're going to talk about in some detail and, and some depth here. He's also produced a lot of different documentaries. Um, tell us just a, just a second about the, some of these documentaries that you've done and, and been involved with with the United Nations even. We have produced a number of documentaries on demographics around the world, looking at uh, the aging population below replacement fertility rates, the disintegration of the natural family worldwide, and the effects that it will have on global populations uh, worldwide and uh, the effect that it will have on for countries uh, for the future. Grab, grab one of those. I think you have a couple of those for, we can show people. Yes. Yeah. So just, we just had, tell us just uh, demographic quick. winter, the decline of human family. Demographic bomb, demography is destiny. Uh, <laughs> new economic reality, demographic winter. And we uh, recently put together a documentary called uh, Outcomes, the Family and Faith Factors. Uh, this outcomes uh, documentary kind of you know raises the question that if um, a child gets spiritual instruction on a weekly basis it will take that child to a whole higher level of competency and we have interviewed uh, social scientists and uh, that have really studied these things and it, we have just some great uh, interviews uh, yeah, that phenomenal. we do to put these uh, documentaries together yeah. And that one of the things I love about it is the fact that it, it was actually instrumental in helping to uh, change the one-child policy of the uh, of the nation of China. We went over to China and uh, <laughs> even interviewed in China and produced this documentary, uh, "Demographic Bomb: Demography Is Destiny," and we flooded it to their policymakers there, and they came, you know, to to, to realize that with just one child, that they really uh, didn't have a future. And so when you can get demographers, economists, and sociologists to come and talk about, you know, a, a country and the direction that they were going mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a country, and well, they yeah. came to realize that they didn't really have a future if they didn't turn that around. And so they really decided to <laughs> at least allow a couple to have a second child, which is yeah. huge. There, there are consequences to disobeying the first law that God ever gave to mankind, which was to multiply and replenish the earth. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, laid stuff. the foundations for what we need to do to create a great nation. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, so that's kind of how uh, you kind of got started yes. with a lot of the video stuff. But that, then you got started with this book. It's called Lost American Antiquities, A Hidden History. So I'm just going to ask you just a quick question right off the bat here, Steve. So... Uh, so what about history? What, what, why is history important? What, what, what do you think as far as from your research, why is a, a history being hidden? Why is that an important thing? Yes. Well, as we know, uh, history to a nation is like, really like memory is to man, that no <laughs> one has influenced the future of society any more than historians, as history provides the foundational underpinnings that's needed for the character building of a nation and a people. Uh, uh, Princeton professor Robert P. George, he came and spoke at Brigham Young University, and he stated that much of what we know about history is just propaganda. <laughs> Uh, that has become very evident, okay, as to uh, really how history can be uh, twisted. And I think we 
learn a little bit about that when you listen to campaign attacks ads, <laughs> how the history of a person, you know, can be Looked twisted a lot ways. of different yeah. ways. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, it's really important how history is handed down. Uh, in fact, I brought up a couple times in these podcasts that uh, that if history wasn't important, then why would Lehi and Sariah literally put their son's lives at risk by sending them back to get the brass plates from King Laban and so forth uh, if, it, if the history wasn't important. Yes. Now, the, the ancient Egyptians would, uh, if you had a new, a new pharaoh that came into power, they would go and, and, and try to erase the, uh, the, the marks and so forth off of the monuments of the previous pharaoh that they had uh, replaced because they wanted to change the history. And that's what we see happening also in America today. I think we see a, a, a desire to basically alter and change the history, not only in America, but also within the church, changing the history. Yes. We see the history taken from us, you know, in so many different ways. And that was it's important. The, that was the case in the 1800s. Yeah. Um, I loved uh, the words of Will Durant, who I uh, at the first chapter of my book, I quoted Will Durant. Mm -hmm. uh, that after writing a uh, multi-volume history of the world, he stated, our knowledge of past events is always incomplete, probably inaccurate, but clouded by ambivalent evidences and biased historians and perhaps distorted by our mm -hmm. patriotic and religious partisanship. So the, the truth of the matter is, you know, we are all a little prejudiced. Okay? <laughs> we, we all no. see things, you know, uh, uh, through our own mind, our own eye, particular lenses, uh, in a, that's right. in a di di different way. But, okay, history uh, is so vitally important for the character building of a people. And we see that really uh, how important it is for the American Indian whose uh, history has really been taken from them. Yeah, so why, I mean, this, this is the, obviously the Annotated Book of Mormon, which we're using as our reference material here. So why is this history important? Uh, <laughs> well, it's definitely a history book. <laughs> and uh, it is vitally important that we understand, you know, how, what has taken place in, in history. Yeah. Uh, we're covering in the, the very end of the of Mormon, in the Book of Mormon. Yes. So this is Mormon chapter 9, verse 16. This is on page 449 in the Annotated Book of Mormon. Yes. It says, Behold, are not the things that God hath wrought marvelous in our eyes? Yea, and who can comprehend the marvelous works of God? Who shall say that it was not a miracle that by his word the heaven and the earth should be? And by the power of his word man was created of the dust of the earth. And by the power of his word have miracles been wrought. You know, so then I love that uh, from the from Mormon there. Um, you know, in regard to these miracles that we've yes. seen and, uh, and and going forth. So, but we wouldn't understand these as miracles really if we didn't have the history. Yeah, it it is vitally important. Uh, I recently purchased a copy of the American Heritage History book entitled uh, Indians. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was printed in 1961. And on the introduction page, uh, President John F. Kennedy uh, shared this statement, that the American Indians remain probably the least understood and the most misunderstood Americans of us all, saying uh, collectively that their history is our history and should be part of our shared and remembered heritage. Yet, uh, of the 424 pages uh, that's found in this uh, book, only two pages are really dedicated to the ancient mound-building cultures of whom the ancient ancestors of America are from. So, if this history uh, has been lost or taken from us, is that, it? you know, <laughs> yeah, is, is that concerning to us? I mean... Uh, history is it's it's vitally important uh, for a society. Yeah. So 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 bottom line is, is that obviously we know that the Book of Mormon is the is a uh, is a way that this history can be known. Yes. So uh, basically, when it comes down to like our, our come follow me these podcasts, it's important that we that we take a minute and actually uh, reflect upon the marvelous work uh, that this actually is. The fact that we actually even have this amazing history. I, it's kind of funny. Yes. I've actually talked to people before. I said, you know, 
if you if you to come up to an average person and say, you know what, uh, we know there was this ancient people here. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we had more information about their history? I mean, who wouldn't want to read a book that says, you know, we have yeah. we have found the history of this ancient people. Who wouldn't want to read that book? But if you if if instead you come to somebody and say, you know, we have a book of history. Oh, but we don't have any idea where that actually took place. Yes. Who would want to read that book? There's no there's no evidence for that history. So that's the reason why we do what we do with all this information and this research. But uh, what we're going to share with you, with what Steve's going to share with us today, is uh, is some fantastic information of how this history actually kind of was been, lost, been silenced, and been silenced. That's and, right. And uh, this history, okay, that there was social engineers, you know, in the 1800s that really understood uh, the importance that history would play in the future of America. Yeah. So that's why we talked about special things that this would come from the dust, and uh, and this would, and this is what we were talking about there in in, uh, in Mormon chapter nine. If you've been following our research for a while, you you already know that we're we're, we're kind of going with uh, with this whole thing because we're going into ether, and the book of ether is about the Jaredites, and archaeologically speaking, there is a civilization that matches amazingly the uh, the time frames as well as the location and so forth yes. of the uh, of the Book of Mormon's uh, Jaredite culture and archaeologically it's called the Adena culture uh, the Adena people or the Adena um, civilization uh, basically um, you know goes way back way way before the Nephite civilization uh, or or the Hopewell Mound Builder people and we really wish we had more uh, on this uh, culture, but, yeah. but an, a, uh, an ether uh, it covers about twenty eight generations <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on, on just a few uh, ch- chap- chapters yeah. that give yeah. us uh, insights into this great uh, culture and civilization that it disappeared, uh, yeah. that was destroyed. Yeah, exactly. So if you go to uh, pages, that we, we have several pages here about this, so if you want to reference that. So on page 452 in the Annotated Book of Mormon is a beautiful uh, uh, an aerial view of the of the largest mound that the uh, the ancient Adena culture ever built. It's in Miamisburg, Ohio, and it's called the Miamisburg Mound, but it's a massive mound. And Steve's going to talk about that a little bit later, so we're not going to go into that uh, you know, right now. But uh, but it was just just phenomenal the the, the view from there. Steve yes. and I have, we we have tromped around these areas <laughs> quite a bit. We have, we've been up on these. We have been on many a mound. <laughs> uh, we've visited a lot of earthwork structures and fortifications. That's right. That's right. And, and it's been really revealing the massiveness of these ancient uh, civilizations yeah. and the kind of structures that they have built. Yep. But so they match up with the time frames of the uh, of the Jaredites of the Book of Mormon just beautifully. They're actually north of the the typical Hopewell Mound Builder stuff. So that's on page 453. It kind of gives you the beginning part 453, 454, and 455 of the annotated Book of Mormon. Actually, give you kind of a background of this Adena civilization and uh, some of the the, uh, the areas that they were in and so forth that they. We're, we're talked about here. There's a little map basically showing the Jaredite nation and how this whole history is going to play out in basically the north northern portion of North America. In the Book of Mormon, it says that the uh, that the Jaredites were brought into the land northward, and the Nephites, the, the, the Lehi and his family, were brought into the land southward. Yes, and that's why they didn't meet each other up until you get to the last guy, the final, the final uh, Coriantumer, basically the last. Um, Jaredite that came wandering into the Nephites basically and after their final battles. But the sources of the Book of Ether are real important too, and this is on page 456. Uh, the plates of Ether came from the 24 gold plates, which were brought by the, uh, well, they were written by uh-huh. the brother of Jared basically. They were uh, the, the last Jaredite king. Um, has a, this, they, this is what they include the, the uh, last Jaredite king list. It has the royal history. Um, then King Mosiah basically did a translation of the 24 plates that his men found when they went up to the north, they got lost. Yes. They came back with those 24 plates and then King Mosiah did the translation and then Mor- Moroni basically then took uh, took them and abridged them and made uh, some additional commentaries about the book of Ether. So, uh, go, so, so jumping into the uh, book of Ether itself on page 458, 
It says, uh, verse one, it says, and now I, Moroni, proceed to give an account of those ancient inhabitants who were destroyed by the hand of the Lord upon the face of this north country. Why do you suppose that they, that the book of Ether was included? I mean, why, why was that so important that they include the book of Ether? Because this is a second witness in the same book of the, of what happens to people when they do not follow God on this covenant promised land we call America. Yes. Uh, Just a couple of things. We're going to jump okay. into some other things that Steve's got ready to share with us here. Verse 34 here real quick. The first uh, chapter of Ether says the brother of Jared being a large and a mighty man and a, and a man highly favored of the Lord. Jared, his brother said unto him, cry unto the Lord that he will not confound us. Now, in the annotated Book of Mormon, we have at, uh, gold, the gold bar there under being a large and mighty man. And so you'll see on page 459, this is actually a, a, a news account from the Evening News of San Jose, California. They're talking about in South Bend, Indiana, finding skeletons that were clad in copper armor and a horde of rare weapons and, and uh, bits of personal adornment have been found in a mysterious mound on the farm of Grove Vosburg near Walkerton. It talks about the 70 year old farmer. Basically, he uh, wanted to find out what was in this mound on his property. Yeah. So they dug into it. They found eight skeletons. They lay in a circular formation arranged like the spokes of a wheel with their skulls together. Copper breastplates, bands, and other bits of armor adorned the skeleton of one man who apparently had been of giant stature. Embedded in, his, in this skull was a beautifully chipped flint arrowhead, which probably produced his death. The soft earth of the mound revealed other treasures three pounds of ore. So me yes. metallic ore, uh, believed to be either silver or white gold, lie with the bones. There were cor uh, corroded copper bands, which antiquarians here believe were used to bind war clubs. Two pipe bowls, one of smooth black stone, another carved with a replica of a fantastic monster or was found. The belief that the bones are not those of Indians, but belong to the ancient and little known race of mound builders has risen. Why? Because of the great size of the bones and the fact that the skull formations are not those of Indian types. The skulls seem to have little forehead and high eye cavities in their in their head. So this is um, just, they, they, these people were huge. And in fact, uh, they did a lot of mining up in the Keweenaw Peninsula of they did. Michigan. There was a lot of mining that took place. And uh, I just happened to bring with me one of the, uh, the uh, their, 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 uh, hammer stones that they would use to break off the pieces of ore of the copper up there in Michigan. Yes. Um, I mean, it, it, takes, it takes, it takes two hands to hold this thing. See, look, look at how, how, how big this thing is You're right there. So, okay. Um, and you can see where they would strap it onto a, uh, onto a, uh, thing and then this this would be the hammering end. Yeah, you can actually see that that's actually been chipped, chipped and off and broken off as they've as they've used it to to basically hammer that. But this thing weighs, yes, probably about uh, about wow. 10, 12 pounds. So if you were wielding that thing all day long, you'd look like Popeye the Sailor Man. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just amazing. So huge. Uh, yeah. How many mines uh, yeah. and. The amount of ore that came out of those ancient mines up in that region of the country. Yeah, I've got I've got a few things to show you when we get into that part. So yeah, so I just wanted to point that out that there was the large and mighty man. Yes. Hey, but before we get out of uh, yeah. Ether One, uh, I think we ought to you know point out as it says in, uh, Ether One Forty Two that there will I meet thee, and I will go before thee into the land which is choice above all other lands of the earth. I mean, yeah. where is that choice land? That land, well, you know, of the Gentiles, see. okay? <laughs> the land where the Constitution be raised up. Uh, I mean... The same land where, where God put Adam and Eve. Yes. In the Garden of Eden. Yes. That was a choice land. It was the first promised land. The one with all the promises and prophecies, you know, that have been uh, foretold. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, this land uh, is that choice land. Uh, America uh, is that land. In fact, I love the words of uh, L. Tom Perry, as he stated <laughs> in the December 2012 uh, Enzyme, that the United States is that promised land foretold in the Book of Mormon. Now, this notice, is notice that he didn't promised say land. it was the Americas. He said the United States, States. is the promised land. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is the land with all the promises and the covenants, you know, 
yeah. uh, relating to what land? This land, that land right. which is underfoot. That's right. And, it's the, and it was the same land where the New Jerusalem was going to be built. According to the Jaredites here in, in Ether, he's the one, they, this is where they talk, tell us that the New Jerusalem is going to be built on this, this land. land. Yes. So verse 43, it says, And there will I bless thee and thy seed and raise up unto me of thy seed and of the seed of thy brother, and they shall go with thee a great nation. And there shall be none greater than the nation which I will raise up unto me of my seed upon all the face of the earth, and thus I will do unto thee, because this long time ye have cried unto me. I mean, do we cry unto the Lord? And are we at that point that we need to be on our knees? Uh, what do you think crying that means to cry? for deliverance, okay? Uh, d- deliverance and for guidance yeah. uh, in this day of uh, great confusion. <laughs> yeah. And uh, great uh, tearing down of the early establishment of our country. Yes, a loss of, uh, again, of so much of our history that uh, is so vitally important that we c- come to understand. Yeah. So, so uh, how do we, how do we cry unto the Lord for these things? I mean, this is, I mean, just, just is it, we're talking just prayer and fasting and so forth, or do we, uh, do we, uh, do we announce it? Do we? Do we do all that we can to uh, to help other people become um, more knowledgeable about this? You know that that is really interesting. I mean, uh, when you think about crying, okay, it might be you know crying out to others, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. not necessarily cr- crying them to, to repentance, <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. uh, to understand that this is uh, yeah. a choice land, uh, one that our heavenly Father had set aside. Uh, for his uh, second coming, yeah, and prepared a path. Yeah, well, I just wanted to point out that uh, make sure that uh, you take a look at page four sixty. Um, this is talking. This, this shows a couple of other axes. They're kind of like this one. This is a a a, a, a fully um, carved axe, basically. But there's some, there's several different uh, things that talk about how big these people were. Um, accounts in Chillicothe, Ohio. Uh, a recent exploration of a mound near this place resulted in some interesting discoveries. The skeleton form was large, the jaws were massive, and the teeth were perfect. They talk about uh, people being, um, let's see, this is from the 12th Annual Report of the Bureau of Ethnology. Documents numer- numerous uh, gigantic skeletons found by Smithsonian agents. Near the, near the original surface of the mound, lying at full length upon its back, was one of the largest skeletons discovered by the Bureau agents. The length has proved by actual measurement being between 7 and 8 feet in the center mound number 11. Three feet below the surface was a vault 8 feet long and 3 feet wide. In the bottom of this lay a skeleton fully 7 feet long. The length from the base of the skull to the bones of the toes were found to be 7 feet 3 inches. It is probable, therefore, that this individual when living was about 7 feet high. So when it says in the Book of Mormon that they were large people, we're talking seriously large people, 7 footers, were uh, were fairly common in their in their civilization. Well, they needed to have big people because, uh, as we read in Ether chapter two, okay, through sixteen through twenty five, mm-hmm. okay, we learned that the Lord prepared His people to cross the great deep, yeah. and uh, maybe he prepared <laughs> them, you know, in their strength and size because really they were adventuring uh, into very rough waters. Uh, they. Yep. They were venturing, you know, to uh, really come to a, a new land yeah. and to cross uh, the the ocean. And I think it's really interesting that they refer to it as the Great Deep, which is kind <laughs> of different, you know, than uh, other bodies of water that you have in the Middle East, uh, such as the Sea of Galilee, yeah, exactly. uh, the Dead Sea, the mm-hmm. Red Sea. And uh, I mean, they're called seas. They they are seas, yeah, and, yeah. and so when when you read the scripture, you know that the seas will divide the land. Okay, it's not where the land divides two seas, because really the oceans you know, they refer to as the great deep. Yeah, exactly. And and so it's really where land okay divides seas, and you look at uh, the Great Lakes area, you look at the Fingers Lakes. I mean, There's you have a that, lot of seas in relationship how they would refer to as seas yeah. uh, yep. in, in, in the scriptures. And so yep. 
as you think of uh, them referring to it as the great deep. And was this a way for God to prepare them uh, for this rugged world that they would be stepping into as they stepped upon the shores of the Americas. Yeah. Well, when you, when you, when you read about the account of, of how, how these were, these, these, uh, yes. these barges were made like tight and unto a dish. They said they were so tight they couldn't even breathe. Said, <laughs> you know, uh, how are we going to breathe? You know, uh, yes. Lord, if, 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 we're, if we're doing this, well, you have to cut a hole in it because it's so tight. I mean, you're basically looking at crossing this 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 yes. this ocean. You can't see even beginning the beginnings to cross it. You're going to get into this this. They said that they were not very large. They said they were rather small. These barges. Yes. And there was eight of them. They had the little stones in there so they could have some light. Yeah. And so forth. But uh, but they actually, I think it's another testimony that they are large and mighty men because um, they built two sets of barges. Apparently, from what the, from what the scripture says that they they built it's in, in verse six of chapter two, it says came to pass that they did travel in the wilderness, did build barges in which they did cross many waters, being directed continually by the hand of the Lord, but the Lord would not suffer that they should stop be, beyond the sea in the wilderness that He would bring them um, that they should come forth even into the land of promise. So they so they actually had to, they they had a four year hiatus basically where yes. they were, uh, were were stopped there, and then they built these barges. Yes. And so they actually built two different sets of ships to get on over here uh, because the Lord wanted them to come to a choice land above all other lands, which the Lord God had preserved for a righteous people. It had been preserved because it got completely wiped clean. This was the same land that Adam and Eve and their posterity were on. They got wiped clean by Noah's Now, that's an important ark. thing to note, okay? Where was Adam and Eve, okay? Yes. Uh, if we believe that they were here in the Americas and Missouri, you know. Which is what John Smith taught, yeah. Uh, then, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, early on, they knew how to navigate the waters and build ships. Uh, that is really an important, you know, th thing to realize. I mean, one person that we interviewed was uh, Dr. Kehoe, Kehoe yeah. Alice uh, yeah. Kehoe, regarding the possibility of uh, transoceanic contact with America before 1492. Dr. Kehoe uh, stated that only one thing needs to be stated, that every type of boat and sailing raft <laughs> has been proven capable in experienced hands of traversing the ocean. The presumed utter isolation of America before Columbus was yeah. <laughs> implausible. Okay, but there was people before this that said, "Oh, the, you know, the Book of Mormon can't be true because there's no way that people had boats clear back then and could make it across the ocean and so forth." Yeah. Yes, is this is Alice Keogh. Now, who now, who is she again? Uh, well, she was a professor. You know, she's a dean, a doctor. Think, she yes. at, at, at Harvard. Uh, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to say just in case it would have been. Yeah. But anyway, anyway yeah, uh, but she was so. very, very well respected. Uh, yes. And worked for, for years uh, in archaeology, uh, l looking at uh, ancient yeah. history. Now, uh, but the thing is to realize, you know, to mariners in a sailboat, these ocean waterways became highways. Yeah. And this is the super highways. This is, this is actually easier to get farther in a boat than, in, yes. than on, on land travel for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the emerging evidence really shows that the pre-Columbian contact with America was extensive. So the idea, you know, that uh, Columbus discovered America as if he was the only one, the first to to arrive at the shores of America from Europe, is yeah. not at all plausible. I want to get just to reiterate the fact that they talked about this promised land in, in, in uh, yes. again, in, in chapter two, uh, verse, where verse, were they going? I mean, it was to that promised, yeah. the land, the land that's exactly. choice above all other lands, the land that got cleansed by the flood when Noah and left, left and so forth. And then, so then here we have the first people who are now back on the land of America Yes, and, uh, and the Lord's bringing them. He says, this is verse nine of chapter two. And this is again, on page 461. And now we can behold the decrees of God concerning what? Concerning this land. That it is a land of promise. And whosoever and whatsoever nations shall possess it shall serve God, or they'll be swept off when the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them. And the fullness of his wrath cometh upon them when? When they are ripened in iniquity. 
For behold, this is a land which is choice above all other lands. Wherefore, he that doth possess it shall serve God or shall be swept off. For it is the everlasting decree of God. It started from the very beginning with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And basically every people who live on this special covenant land, either they serve God or he can't allow them to remain on this special land. And it is not until the fullness of iniquity among the children of the land that they are swept off. And then he says this. this is, I love this little, this is uh, basically, I feel like this is Moroni talking directly yes. to us. He says, and this cometh unto you, O Gentiles. So he's now talking directly to us, that ye may know the decrees of God. And so we, powerful. We go back, you know, to to this land. I mean, that is a demonstrative. That yeah. points direction. Okay, yeah. it's not those lands. It's not that land. It is this land, America. Exactly. Okay, which was underfoot. Okay, in which Joseph Smith testified. Now we're going to jump into some really good stuff here with Steve. But just before we do this, on, on page four sixty two of the Annotated Book of Mormon, we have a, a, an amazing statement here from Marion G. Romney. He was the second counsel in the first presidency, and this is in his Ensign article called America's Promise. And he says, just as Jesus Christ has piloted to this land of America, the vanguard of each succeeding civilization which was, has dwelt upon it, so has he made known to them his everlasting decree that whosoever should possess it shall serve him the true and only God, or they'll be swept off when they are ripened in iniquity. Our present civilization is no exception. We who live in America are under this everlasting decree. And the Lord has said, my word shall be verified at this time as it hath hitherto been verified. That's from the Doctrine and Covenants section 5, verse 20. Jesus Christ, the God of this land, led Columbus to it. He led the pilgrims to Plymouth. He sustained and gave victory to the colonists. He established the Constitution of the United States. And if you don't believe that, uh, you can go to Doctrine and Covenants section 101, verse 80. Over a period of some 26 centuries, he directed the writing of the Book of Mormon, which contains the record of the former inhabitants of this land. At his command, Moroni finished the record and hid it up in the hill Cumorah, where, where under his surveillance, he was safe, it was safely preserved for some 1,400 years. By the power of Jesus Christ, the God of this land, the record was brought forth, translated, and in 1830 published, for nearly 150 years now, it has been bearing this message to all who will receive it. After setting forth the everlasting decree concerning this land and reviewing the destruction of two civilizations, Moroni, seeing the present inhabitants of America, because Christ showed Moroni us, right? He yes. showed us, he showed, uh, Christ showed Moroni our day. He says, and knowing by the power of God that we would have the record, penned this message directly to those who would inhabit this land. And this cometh unto you, that ye may know the decrees of God, that ye may repent and not continue in your iniquities until the fullness come, that ye may not bring down the fullness of the wrath of God upon you, as the inhabitants of the land have hitherto done. Such a powerful Are we going to heed us. that warning? Yep. That is a powerful warning. Yep. Uh, and when, uh, how many times has he referred to this land? Yeah. which is uh, very directional. That is that which is underfoot. And then, and then actually, then in, in Ether chapter 5, which is, let's jump up to Ether chapter 5 for just a second, because, uh, yes. because Ether actually prophesied about something of our day, and then Moroni basically, he, he, he was shown our day, yeah. and, and, and what was he shown? Well, I mean, is there a necessity, okay, to have witnesses? Yes. Okay, has God used witnesses to really testify of his work? Yes, he has. Absolutely. And so we read in Ether chapter 5. Yes, and so Ether chapter 5, basically, this is verse 2, it says, And behold, ye may be privileged that ye may show the plates unto those who shall assist to bring forth this work. And who was assisting? Basically, Oliver Cowdery and a little bit of Martin Harris, right? Yes. And woe, un, uh, excuse me, and unto three shall they be shown by the power of God. Wherefore, they shall be known of a surety that these things are true. And in the mouth of three witnesses shall these things be established, and the testimony of three, and this work in, with, in the which shall be shown forth the power of God and also his, his word, of which the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost bear record. And all this shall stand as a testimony against the world at the last day. So have we been given a witness? Uh, yes, we had three witnesses. 
And David Whitmer, uh, one of the three special witnesses to the Book of Mormon, stated that when we were first told to publish our statement, the testimony of the three witnesses, mm -hmm. we felt sure that the people would not believe it. For the Book of Mormon told of a people who was educated, refined, and dwelt in large cities. The Lord told us that He would make it known to the people and that He would lead them to discover ruins of great cities and abundant of evidence of the truth of what was written in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's a, a, a quote. And, and that is how uh, David Whitmer and the other three witnesses, you know, were deeply concerned because what was being handed down and shared with them is the question that were there highly advanced uh, cultures that lived here? Were there great cities uh, that were constructed? And we're here to tell you, yes, uh, there were a magnitude, you know, of uh, overwhelming tens of thousands yes. of earthworks, structures, fortifications and mounds that show evidence, you know, of a thriving civilization. I mean, they understood lunar alignments. They understood metallurgy. I mean, these were highly sophisticated, you know, uh, cultures that grew uh, here in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Now, the Lord told us, okay. And this is uh, uh, David Whitmer, you know, uh, stating that he would make it known to the people and he would lead them to discover the ruins of great cities and abundant, abundant of evidence of the truth of what is written in the book. So uh, what. Well, now this, this is civilization here, Steve, okay. that we're talking about. Yeah. I'll, I'll never forget when we were on the tour together. Uh -huh. and, uh, and and uh, and all of a sudden it was raining. We were just outside of uh, we're in in uh, Newark, Ohio, and all of a sudden this guy was tapping on the door of the bus. Yes, <laughs> we came up and it was Bradley Lepper, who's the, uh, the 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 head archaeologist of the state of Ohio, and then, and then we interviewed him. And in that interview, he talked about how amazing this ancient civilization was. Yes. That uh, some of these giant earthen constructions, that they are such a magnitude that there are uh, few that can even rival it and so there was, uh, the, in, the, in the, the world. The amount of labor involved with some of these mounds and the mound building, uh, this yes. mound building culture was greater than the labor involved in the Great Wall of China. Yes. And, uh, and the pyramids of Egypt, he compared them to, the, the accomplishments of the civilization. Yes. So are there great uh, c cities? Uh, found here in North America. And is there an abundance of evidence uh, that gives testimony, you know, to these uh, ancient civilizations? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what really is amazing. Now, both uh, Elder Legrand Richards and also Elder uh, Tadar Callister in his uh, recent book, A Case for the Book of Mormon, uh, he shared that even Joseph Smith had concerns with how the Book of Mormon might be received. Uh, mm -hmm. So he prayed, uh, O oh Lord, what will the world say? And the answer came back, Fear not, I will cause the earth to testify of the truth of these things. Do we really understand how incredible these uh, ancient cultures were that lived here in North America that give testimony and uh, is that information starting to, you know, roll forward? Yeah. So uh, in this, you know, <laughs> what we've talked about here, you know, uh, I want you, you know, to ask yourself uh, as we talk about some of these ancient uh, earthwork constructions, does that give evidence of this uh, civilization that Joseph Smith was told would uh, come forward to the people? A lot, a lot of times they were having a hard time believing it because they said, well, wait a minute. Um, if the Book of Mormon is talking about these great cities and everything else, where are they? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so they started to actually say, well, gosh, you know, well, where, you know, what, what's going on with that? And that's actually part of the reason why the, uh, the idea that the Book of Mormon happened in Central America became more popular later on because they had these, you know, these big ruins down in Chichen Itza and, and Tulum and, 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 uh, and all these different, uh, uh, Carigua and, and Palenque and so forth. Yes. And, um, and, and people thought that the Indians up here in North America, well, they were termed as ignorant savages. 
Yeah. <laughs> and we, That's going to strike a little bit of a chord know. with you, I know. It, 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 it does. <laughs> But the thing that uh, that I, I just want to point out here, yes, okay, as yes. we're talking about these, you know, uh, th- these civilizations that were uh, built here. Yeah. I mean, we interviewed uh, Dr. Roger Kennedy, a former director of the Smithsonian American History Museum. In his landmark book, Hidden Cities, uh, that we, we, we have here, mm-hmm. uh, in which he published in 1994, Dr. Roger Kennedy recounts this startling personal events that kind of led him to writing his book, inspired by what he found by exploring subterranean caves found in the state of Indiana. As he realized from the artifacts being found that others had walked those same paths, you know, through that cave centuries uh, earlier. Now, Dr. Roger Kennedy went on to say in his book that few realize that some of the most complex structures of ancient archaeology were built in North America home of some of the most highly advanced and well-organized civilizations in the world. And so Uh, uh, there are uh, some incredible works. And that's what, you know, just, we are just amazed, you know, how... By the way, that's silent. Yeah, I I wanted to bring this up because we actually have this in our bookstore. If you want to get a copy of his book, it's called Hidden Cities. It's getting very hard to find because he passed away a couple of years ago. And so they're not really publishing in his book anymore. So if you want to get a copy, you need to get it pretty quickly. He, 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 I love he, the quotes he, from here. It's just amazing. This yeah, guy. Yeah. Uh, and he said, and he, he came and actually said, he said, the discovery and loss of ancient North American civilization. Yes. What was he talking about there? And he was working at the Smithsonian. I mean, yeah. I mean, he spent 28 years, yeah. you know, there. And so. Oh, by, by the way, I, I just got to read one, one little quote out of here. So those of you who have the, uh, the, the, the Exploring the Book of Mormon in America's Heartland book, it's literally right in the very front like the second, I think it's the uh, the first page in, is a direct quote from Hidden Cities here. And this is what it says. It says, few realize that some of the oldest, largest, and most complex structures of ancient archaeology were built of earth, clay, and stone right here in America, in the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys. From 6,000 years ago until quite recently, North America was home to some of the most highly advanced and well-organized civilizations in the world complete with cities, roads, and commerce. I mean, we were able to interview him right before his passing, and it is awesome. a, a great, great record that we were able to, to get. Oh, by the and, way, when you're talking about that, you got, you got to tell us, okay. So well, the thing is... This is where they can see the interview. If you want to see the interview with Dr. Roger Kennedy, it's on the Lost Civilizations of North America documentary. And uh, we're going to tell you how that kind of came about. too. Well, the interesting thing <laughs> afterwards, uh, you know, when he heard that we were going to name this documentary, The Lost Civilizations in North America, he kind of shook his head. He says, no, no, no. You know, he says uh, they weren't lost. They were hidden. <laughs> <laughs> they were they, they were a, a, his book a, 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 a civilization and so yeah. and here he was on the front line okay he knew about the silence surrounding these uh, ancient mound building cultures and he was just an, an incredible man that voice really needs to be heard now today uh, there's still uh, many ancient archaeological sites that you could go visit I mean, recently I visited the Okamoki Mound site in Macon, yeah. Georgia, yeah, and where you, ha- site, yes. I mean, you have three uh, very impressive giant mounds. I mean, in one is a burial mound, one uh, is a giant platform mound, and the other one you had an in, uh, interior chamber, okay, mm-hmm. uh, inside that you can go, and these are archaeological sites that you can go visit. And I just want to tell you that if you can't go and visit it personally, I would highly recommend that you uh, view Rod's uh, flyover drone uh, videos. Oh, yeah. Where you get this drone perspective as you're looking down at, at, at these sites. Uh, I mean, it is very <laughs> in, 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 impressive. I mean, uh, there we go. But, if, but this will give you kind of a feel for the magnitude of these ancient c- cultures uh, that existed yeah. here in North America. Many of these sites are so big that you can't really effectively see them from the ground. You have to get up in the, in a, yes. in the drone 
to be able to get up high enough so you can actually see these sites. But there's this has some of the most beautiful uh, uh, drone uh, oh, it video is. and so forth. I'll set to music. And it everything. really is amazing. And it actually kind of goes through the Book of Mormon chronology. Yes. It's called Visualizing Book of Mormon Chronology. What was it like to live then? Yes. Now, one of the best records that we have of these uh, ancient mound building cultures constructions, okay, was E.G. Squire, who uh, authored the very first publication of the Smithsonian. And this book is The Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. Which we've talked about in these podcasts a number yes. of times. So, yeah, we've referenced it quite a bit. Yes. And and these these are very impressive of what we learned, you know, in these uh, st studying this. However, like Joseph Smith, E.G. Squires uh, would likewise uh, get himself in trouble <laughs> in trying to refer to the Indian populations, okay, as uh, coming from a more advanced culture. And as a result, uh, he was going against this manifest destiny agenda, which was to gather up the Indians and to put them on uh, Can you, can you explain that just for a second, Steve? Explain it a little bit more. What, what is manifest destiny for those who may not know what that is about? Yes. I mean, it was really advanced, okay, in the 1800s to really uh, take the lands uh, from the Indian populations mm -hmm. and uh, that we had some higher right, you know, to the land than, than they uh, have. <laughs> when, when people reject God on this land, then, then other people are going to come in and take over. Yes. But, uh, wow. Well, as, as, as we look at that, okay, do we really have, you know, the, the rights to, to the lands? That is something that has been debated and was <laughs> well, really being be debated, debated in that day. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, uh, uh, Squire, uh, after turning over, uh, his f first two books to the Smithsonian. He was a prolific writer. Uh, he really complained about the heavy-handed editing uh, that took place uh, on the books that he turned over to the Smithsonian. So he took his third book, mm -hmm. which is uh, the Antiquities, you know, the state of New York, okay, and he uh, and his uh, Aboriginal right monuments of, of, of New York, and. He, he decided to, that he was going to self-publish them uh, in Buffalo, New York, because he was uh, tired. He was being censored. Of, yes. Why? That, that, Does that happen? No, that never happens. Nobody gets censored. No, nobody gets censored. <laughs> uh, Not for telling the truth. Is yeah. <laughs> where where he sh shared this observation, uh, which he stated, there is almost positive evidence that the mound builders were an agricultural people, considerably advanced in the arts, and providing great uniformity throughout the whole territory, which they occupied in manners, habits, and religion. A uniformity sufficiently marked to identify them as a single people, having a common origin, a common modes of life, and as a consequence, common and uh, common sympathy. sy sympathies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if not a common and consolidated government. Now, if they have a consolidated government, you know, that is pretty self-evident because as you go around these different sites, you find that there was some master architect, you know, some governing body because you go to one and it has the same squares, squares and and the circles, the same size and uh, facing the same directions yes. and so forth or, or 90 degrees <laughs> juxtaposed to each other. And I mean, it's, that's amazing. It, it really is. And so as you start, you know, getting to understand these ancient cultures uh, of the Hopewell and the Dina here in North America. It is amazing uh, what they were able to construct. So there's basically kind of two different opinions here, right? You basically had the opinion of the Indians were just a bunch of ignorant savages. They never had achieved anything close to civilization. Yes. They were just a bunch of uh, nut and berry hunters and hunter gatherer people. And uh, and then you have squires and, and, and other people come in and saying, well, wait a minute, no, look at look at where they came from. They may be they may be hunter gatherers right now, but their ancestors yes. were anything but. Yes. They were highly advanced roads, cities, commerce, everything else going on here. Um, and, and but I, people didn't want to believe them because yes, if they were being ran off their lands and ran from place to place, yeah. I mean, had to live off the land. Okay, yes, yeah, some people would perceive them that way. Yeah. And uh, was it just you know other people coming to the Americas that did that? No, you know they had civil wars. 
okay, take taken place uh, within their own culture. Yeah. Now the ba- battles of opinion, okay, kind of escalated against <laughs> yeah. uh, Squire because he was, you know, saying such things as this that they were, you know, more highly advanced uh, cultures here in North America. You see, it'd be a little bit harder. See, if 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 this was a highly advanced civilization, then it would be harder to deny them, for example. Yeah, you don't have to give the ability rights. to vote. Well, or to own land. Yes. Or to be treated as equals to the Europeans who were who were coming over. Yes. You can't take the, the, the lands, you know, from from them. But if they weren't as evolved, yes. then it's okay. Because they, they because they're kind of just they're 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 less evolved. We're gonna, yes. we're we're gonna, gonna talk we, about we, that. We're, we're gonna minute. dig into that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. uh the, the thing to realize, okay, that Squire, okay, although he was put up on a pedestal and uh, his works was, you know, held as a monumental work uh, at the time. Uh, he he was uh, starting to feel some persecution. Yeah. And uh, he was actually placed in this insane asylum for the last 14 years of his life. Uh, wow. But uh, he surveyed, you know, many great works. And this is one uh, that uh, E.D. Squire, you know, sur- surveyed. And this is wow. really what kind of got us. So he was on persecuted this path. to the point that they actually put him in an insane asylum. Uh, yes. Over this whole thing. Uh, and well, we don't know if it's, you know, just on that, this. Yeah. We're just say- saying that uh, there's no question it had, you know, a real effect uh, on him. Uh, that they he was he was placed in Saint Simon for the last years of his life. Wow! In looking at this giant earth con- construction, this is from one qu- of their surveys, actually. Yes. Yeah. A question was raised, you know, whether or not the Hebrews traveled to here to the Americas uh, <laughs> while visiting <laughs> Mound City National Park. Uh, I pulled out this uh, survey uh, plat map. Gra- gra- grab that right there. It's right there. Yes. Like, this is a copy of, uh, of what, well, kind, the, of, kind of what the, we were This is about. abbreviated, you know, some of the pages. Yeah. This is actually a very thick uh, book of all the surveys. Yeah, the full book. That yeah. Squire and Davis, Dr. Davis, you know, went out and, and surveyed. And I mean, they, you know, hundreds of, the, of these mounds, like I said, they gathered about 6,000 artifacts and uh, were going around and talking about uh, this uh more advanced, you know, culture than they would really like to view the Indians as, and that that the Indians were the ancestors, okay, of uh, these great mound building cultures. Yeah, the descendants, yes, of those people. Now, w- while visiting uh, Mound City National Park, <laughs> I was there. And I'll never with forget. Rod. This was awesome. I got off the bus, <laughs> okay, and I'd been reading, okay, the ancient monuments of the Mississippi. Uh, Valley, which was the first publication of the Smithsonian. Yeah. And uh, I w- walked in, you know, and I said, Rod, who should I be talking to, you know, uh, about this? Because I opened to this page that you can see on the screen there of this uh, giant earth of construction that really shows a uh, Hebrew oil lamp like and a, a menorah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And we were with a Semitic uh, yes. scholar, you know, that pointed out a whole bunch of other uh, symbolisms, okay, yes. th- through this uh, construction. I said, Rod, who should I talk to? Him? And he guided me up to the director. It's uh, Bruce Lombard at the time. Uh, and he's since passed away. I don't know if you knew that or not. I, I, I yeah, didn't. He's passed but, away. But, but we, we, <laughs> we asked him. I opened it to this and it says... I want to go and see this giant earthen construction. I, I want to recreate this, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Steve comes up. We got Bruce Lombard is on the other side of the, of yes. the countertop. There, Steve's got this book, and he, and he opens it up, and he says, like, "You pointed to it and said, could we go see this?'" Yeah, I want. I want to go see this one. <laughs> yeah, Th- this is amazing. I mean, it just has uh, so many symbolisms. Uh, where is yeah. it? We showed this to him and started, you know, visiting with him, and and, he, and I says, "So, where do we need to go?" And he says, well, you can get in back in your bus and you can go down the highway. <laughs> and there at the crossroads in Milford, okay, there at the corner, that is where it was. But the Army Corps of Engineers okay, there came in <laughs> and virtually has wiped it clean. Now, maybe you can find, you know, some of the corners and that, but for the most part, it is wiped clean. Yeah. And, and that started, you know, us asking ourselves the question. I mean, isn't this America's antiquities that we're talking about? I mean, isn't this uh, something that should be preserved? Yeah. And uh, who 
was in a position to pull that trigger and to say, this is something, you know, that should be destroyed. Stay tuned for part two. You can find the new virtual expo at bookofmormonevidencestreaming.com. We advertise 60 new videos, but actually almost double that amount. So you'll have plenty of inspiration to carry you through the fall and into the holiday season. Don't miss out on more than 110 new videos now in our library. Special guest speakers are Glenn Beck, David Barton, and Tim Ballard. You'll have access for three whole months, as well as receiving two bonuses that will offset your complete subscription cost. The first is The Destruction of Christ's Death, which is a two-hour streaming video by Rod Meldrum which is a $20 value, as well as his new 40-page ebook called Prophecies and Promises. What did Joseph know? That's a $15 value. We're excited for you to join us.